reading out of Passport to Magonia on UFO Folklore and Parallel Worlds by Jacques Vallée. Uh, part 8 now of our reading. And I don't know what that is. That day. Anyways. We're now this section of chapter to Magonia and back. The mind of a person coming out of a fairyland is usually blank as to what has been seen and done there. Walter Wentz, the fairy faith in Celtic countries. The fairy and Celtic or Celtic, depending how you pronounce it, Celtic. Countries. Archive.org. We see if they got it. Looks like they do. Okay. The mind of a uh, private first class Jerry Irwin was blank when he woke up on March 2nd, 1959 in Cedar uh, uh, City Hospital. He had been unconscious for 23 hours. At times mumbling incoherently something about a jacket on the bush. Okay. When he became conscious, his first question was, Were there, were there any survivors? The story of Private Irwin is a mysterious one and very little has been done to clarify it. It has been mentioned only once in the UF litig UFO literature by James Lorenzen, the director of APO, APRO group, and has not, to the best of my knowledge, been the subject of subsequent investigation. Such an investigation, however, would throw light on some aspects of the UFO problem now gaining considerable publicity and causing some concern to those who follow the, the development of the sociological context of UFO reports. Perhaps, as Lorenzen suggests, there was a military investigation that has been kept secret. If so, secrecy on the part of the authorities, if they are really concerned with the nation's peace of mind, is not the best course, as the following review of the few well-established facts of, Irwin, of the Irwin case, which serves as an introduction to a discussion of the problem of con contact makes clear. Late on February 28, 1959, Gary Irwin, a Nike missile technician, was driving from Naples, Napa, excuse me, Idaho, <coughs> back to his barracks at Fort Bliss, El Paso, Texas. He was returning uh, from military leave he had reached Cedar City Utah and turned southeast on Route 14 when he observed an unusual phenomenon six miles after the, the turnoff the landscape brightened and a glowing object crossed the sky from right to left Irwin stopped a car and got out he had time to watch 
the object as it continued in an easterly direction until hidden from view by a ridge. The witness decided that he might have seen an airliner on fire attempting a forced landing, in which case there was no time to lose. Consequently, instead of resuming his journey, Irwin wrote a note. I have gone to investigate possible plane crash. Please call law enforcement officers. And placed it on the steering wheel of, the, of his car using sh shoe polish. He wrote, stop uh, on the side of his car to make sure people would find his note. He then started out, out on foot. Approximately 30 minutes later, a fish and game inspector did stop. He took the note from Cedar City to the Cedar City Sheriff, Otto uh, Peef, Peef, I guess, who gathered a party of volunteers and returned to the site. 90 minutes after he had uh, sighted the strange object, Gary Irwin was discovered unconscious and taken to the hospital. No trace of an airplane crash was found. At the hospital, Dr. Broadbent uh, observed that Irwin's temperature and respiration was normal. He seemed merely to be asleep, but he could not be awakened. Dr. Broadbent diagnosed hysteria. Then, when Irwin did wake up, he felt fine, although he was still puzzled by the object he had seen. He was also puzzled by the disappearance of his jacket. He was assured that he was not wearing it when he was found by the search party. Irwin was flown back to Fort Bliss and placed under observation at William Beaumont Army Hospital for four days, after which period he returned to, to duty. His security clearance, however, was revoked. Several days later, Erwin fainted while walking in the camp, but he recovered rapidly. Several days afterward, on Sunday, March 15, he fainted again in an El Paso in an El Paso street and was taken to the Southwest General Hospital. There, his physical condition was found similar to that observed in Cedar City. He woke up about 2 a.m. on a Monday and asked, Where's, were there any survivors? He was told that the date was not February 28th, but March 16th. Once more, he was taken to William Beaumont Hospital and placed under observation by psychiatrists. He remained there over one month. Lorenzen reports that according to a Captain Valentine, the results of the test indicated that he was normal. He was discharged on April 17th. Uh, the next day, following an unidentifiable but very powerful urge, he left the fort without <coughs> leave and caught a bus to El pa in, in El Paso and arrived in Cedar City Sunday afternoon, at April 19th. Walked to the spot where he had seen the object, left the road, went back through the hills, <coughs> right to a bush where his jacket lay. There was a pencil and a buttonhole with a piece of paper uh, wound, wound tightly um, around it. He took the paper and burned it. Then he, he seemed to come out of a trance. He had looked f for the road not understanding why he had come there. He turned himself in and thus met Sheriff Otto uh, 
Beth, Beef, Beef, who gave him the details of the first incident. Lorenzen's contacted Irwin after he had returned to Fort Bliss and undergone a new psychological examination, as futile as the previous one. His case came to the attention of the Inspector General, who ordered uh, a new examination. On July 10, Irwin re re-entered William Bowman Army Hospital. On August 1st, he failed to report for duty. One month later, he was listed as a deserter. He was never seen again. New Hampshire revisited. The Irwin case is reminiscent of another incident that has become one of the standards of modern American folklore. The report by Betty and Barney Hill and their examination under hypnosis by Dr. Benjamin Simon, which has been documented at length by John Fuller in his excellent book, Interrupted Journey. So let's see about that, oh, interrupted, interrupted Journey. The end. Interrupted Journey Archive.org Might be, might be there. I'm not sure. It says John Fuller in the Northern Jersey. Documented experience might be a video. It looks like they have that as well. I wonder if I should do these live instead of doing it this way. It might be more tolerable by my fumbling and stumblings. Could be. The reader must carry in mind the main features of Irwin and Hill cases in order to follow the discussion. That is, the ca cases discusses in the object. That is the object of the present chapter. So those already familiar with the cases must forgive me if I repeat what is already well known to them. But in doing so, I hope some observations will come to light that have not previously been published. Report number 100-1-61 and the files of the 100th Bomb Wing Strategic Air Command Peace Air Force Base, New Hampshire was prepared by Major Paul W. Anderson, the only official document concerning the Hill case. It apparently has never been, it has never before been published, yet it contains a detail of which both Dr. Simon and John Fuller were unaware. The object seen by the Hills had been detected by military radar. During a casual conversation on the 22nd of September 1961 between uh, Major Gardner uh, B. Reynolds, uh, 100th uh, Bomber Wing, I guess BW must be Bomber Wing, uh, DC-01, and Captain Robert O. Uh, Doubt Doubterday, uh, commander of 1917-2 uh, AACS DIT uh, P's AFB must be Air Force Base New Hampshire and what revealed it revealed a strange incident occurred at 
zero two fourteen our um, local on twenty September. No importance was attached to the incident at the time. Subsequent uh, interrogation failed to bring out any f information in addition to the extract from the daily report of controller. The visual sighting itself is summarized as follows. On the night of uh, 19 through 20 September, between uh, 20 uh, slash um, 0, 0001 and 20 slash 0100, Mr. and Mrs. Hill were traveling south on Route 3 near Lincoln, New Hampshire, when they observed through the windshield of their car a strange object in the sky. They noticed it beca because of its shape and the intensity uh, of its lighting as compared to the stars of the sky. The weather in the sk was clear at the at the time. My my son's bird is like going nuts on the little house. Are you making yourself a house, are you? He's going, 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 going. He likes messing with it, huh? Or she likes messing, whatever it is. Anyways, uh, in the report itself under paragraph E, location and details, we read that Betty Hill's account of the sighting as reported by Peace Office Pease Air Force Base officials. The observers were traveling by car in a southerly direction on Route 3 south of Lincoln, New Hampshire, when they noticed a brightly lit object ahead of their car at an angle of a of elevation of approximately 40 degrees. It appeared strange to them because of its shape and the intensity of its lights compared to the stars in the sky. Weather and sky were clear. They continued to observe the object from their moving car for a few minutes then stopped. After stopping the car they used binoculars at, the, at times. They reported that the object was traveling north very fast. They report it changed directions rather abruptly and then bended south shortly and thereafter it stopped and hovered in the air. There was no sound evident up to this time. Both observers used the binoculars at this point. While hovering, objects began to appear from the body of the object, which they described as looking like wings, which made a V shape, then extended the wings, had red lights on the tips. At this point, they observed it to appear to swoop down in the general direction of their audio, or their auto, excuse me. The object continued to descend until it appeared to be only a matter of hundreds of feet above their car. At this point, they decided to get out of the, that area and fast. Mr. Hill was driving and Mrs. Hill was watched the object by sticking her head out of the window. It departed in a generally northwesterly direction but Mrs. Hill was prevented from observing it. Its full departure by her p position in the car. They report that while the object was above them after it had swooped down, they heard a series of short, loud buzzes, 
which they described as sounding like someone had dropped a tuning fork. They report that they could feel these buzzing sounds in their auto. auto. No further visual observations were made of this object. They continued on their trip and when they arrived in the vicinity of Ashland, New Hampshire, about 30 miles from Lincoln, they again, again heard the buzzing sound of the object. However, they did not see it at, the t- at this time. Mrs. Hill reported the flight pattern of the object to be erratic and changed directions rapidly. That during its flight, it ascended and descended numerous times very rapidly and flight was described as jerky and not smooth. Mrs. Hill is a civil service employee in the Boston Post Office and doesn't possess any technical or scientific training. Neither does his... Neither does his wife. So did I say Mrs. earlier? Let's try this again. Mr. Hill is a civil service employee in the Boston Post Office and doesn't possess any technical or scientific training. Neither does his wife. During a later conversation with Mr. Hill, he volunteered to and volunteered the observation that he did not originally intend to report this incident but in so much as he and his wife did in fact see the occurrence, he decided to report it. Lie says, I, I, I don't know if this is lie, right? I don't know why he always says lie. Lie says that on looking, uh, it's got to be a misprint. Maybe it's he says. He says uh, that on looking back, he feels that the whole thing is incredible and he feels somewhat foolish. He just can't believe that such a thing could and did happen. He says on the other hand that they both saw what they reported and this fact gives it some degree of reality. Information contained herein was collected by means of telephone conversation between the observers and the preparing in and the preparing individual the reliability of the observer cannot be judged and while his apparent hostility and seriousness appears to be valid it cannot be judged at this time this report is remarkable for what it does not contain in respect, it is probably typical of a large class of uh, Air Force records, most of those involving close proximity to a UFO, where either witnesses, either witness reluctance or lack of adequate follow-up eliminated the most significant information. In the present case, the witness failed to give the Air Force any information as to the beings they could see aboard the craft during their observation with binoculars. The proper investigation would have disclosed an element of which they were not immediately aware they could not account for a time gap of two hours between the two periods of buzzing sounds. In fact, they could not recall how they had driven the 35 miles between Indian Head and Ashland so casually mentioned in the Air Force report. What happened after their story became known as well documented in John Fuller's books, book, both witnesses had a series of strange nightmares. The dreams led them to see a psychiatrist who used hypnosis to discover the root of the problem. 
It was only then found that the origin of the nightmares could be traced to those missing two hours. Under separate hypnosis, Betty and Barney Hill said they had been taken by the strange beings into a UFO. I have been privileged to hear the portion of the tapes com- covering the abduction of B- Betty and Barney Hill. Further discussion with the witnesses and with Dr. Simon and John Fuller leads me to regard this case not as an individual event to be investigated and treated as such, but on, con- on the contrary as an incident indication of a general pattern that cannot be separated from the total phenomena. First, it is interesting to note that as further details came to the Hill's memories after treatment, the case took on more of the features present in other UFO landings on which the Hills could not have heard. One such detail is the recollection by Betty Hill that after their car was stopped, a group of men had come towards them. The creatures had opened the door of the vehicle and pointed a small device at her. When I asked her to what usual, I asked her to what usual object she could compare it, she told me, it could have been a pencil. It is not necessary to repeat the descriptions given by the Hills of the manner in which they were abducted or of the conditions inside the object. It is enough to say that the statements made under hypnosis by Betty and Barney are in general agreement. Are in general agreement. It is n- also useful to study the detailed accounts of the entities. Betty states, most of the men are my height, none is as tall as Barney, so I would judge uh, uh, them to be five to five foot four. Their chests were larger than ours, Their noses were larger, longer than the average size, although I have seen people with noses like theirs, like Jimmy Darren's. They, uh, complexions, uh, were, uh, (coughs) I guess it's Darren. Their complexions were of a gray tone, like a gray, like the a gray paint with a black base. Their lips were of a bluish tint. Hair and eyes were very dark, possibly black. In a sense, they looked like a mongoloids. Uh, this sort of round face and broad forehead along with a certain type of coarseness. The surface of their skin seemed to be a bluish gray but probably whiter than that. Their eyes moved. They had pupils. Somehow I had the feeling they were like more like cat's eyes. Barney on the other hand says this. The men had rather odd-shaped heads with a large cranium and diminishing in size as it got toward the chin. The eyes contained around, uh, continued ra- around in, let me try this, and the eyes continued around to the size of their heads so that it appeared that they could see several degrees beyond the lateral extent of our vision. This was startling to me. The mouth was much like when you draw one horizontal line 
with a short perpendicular line on each end. This horizontal line would represent the lips without the muscles th that we have. It would part slightly as they made this mur uh, mum uh, mumming sound. Mum mumming sound. The texture of the, the, the skin as I remember it from this quick glance was grayish, almost metallic-like. I didn't notice any hair or headgear for that matter. I didn't notice any proboscis. proboscis. Uh, there just seemed to be two slits that represented the nostrils. There are some obvious contradictions between the two descriptions, but Betty speaks of very dark hair. Barney did not notice any. The men described by Barney did not exactly evoke in my mind the picture of Jimmy Dantry, Durant. Excuse me. On the other hand, the creatures are strikingly re reminiscent of the UFO operators of the large number of stories unknown outside of the very small group of specialists. Apart from disagreement on the nose and lips, Betty's statement matches the description made by Barney of the shape of the head and the color and appearance of the skin. Another remark by Betty is significant in this respect. I got the impression that the leader and their examiner were different from the crew members. But this is hard to say because I really didn't want to look at the men. Two other elements are outstanding in this case. One of them is the matter of communication with the strange beings. They communicate among themselves through an audible language which was definitely not understandable to the witness yet when they communicated with the hills their thoughts came through in english betty thinks that they spoke english with an accent while barney feels that the words and the presence of the entity uh, were two separate things I did not hear any actual noise, but in my mind I knew what he was saying. It wasn't as if he was talking to me with my eyes open, and he was sitting across the room from me. It was more as if the words were there, a part of me. He was outside the actual creation of the words themselves. This very remarkable statement and excellent description of the mechanisms that trigger the communication may well be a clue to the entire episode. And it certainly uh, places the case in the domain of the theory of apparitions as it is treated, for instance, by Terrell in his celebrated 1942 Myers lecture before the British Society of uh, uh, Psychical Research. So, Psychical Research. Thus, it is noteworthy that the apparent absurdity of the sequence of actions constituting the episode should be reducible to the triggering of high-level uh, perception patterns within the witness's brain. And not necessarily through an actual normal physical process. And this characteristic in its turn is reminiscent both of neural uh, physiological experiments and of reports by the most reliable observers of ghosts, although, of course, ghosts are distinguished from the class of phenomena 
we are studying here by the absence of material traces which makes their in interpretation a good deal simpler while it is probable that a complete theory of ghosts could confine the phenomena to parameters within the human nervous system the same is not true of ufos for this reason therefore it is crucial to pursue the investigation of cases of apparitions in older times in relation to reports such as that of the hills the recognition of a strong psychological or psychic if you prefer component in ufo manifestations makes such a study imperative if the phenomena are to be ascribed to uh, psychological causes then the causes must have manifested themselves during all epoch epochs although naturally sociologists could give various uh, reasons uh, to expect a considerable increase in such manifestations since World War II. On the other hand, if the phenomena of the dog birders is going at it, if uh, if the phenomenon is not wholly psychological in nature, then the discovery of historical uh, antecedents would be a valuable clue to its nature. The experiment performed by Betty Hill by the entities is therefore quite remarkable. It will be recalled that while she was in the craft, Betty was submitted to a uh, for some reason I'm thinking of Howard Stearns right now. <laughs> it was a uh, uh, it will be, re and, and, and uh, yeah, it was submitted to a simulated medical test under uh, hypnosis. She reported that a long needle was inserted into her navel, that she felt pain, that the pain stopped when the leader made a certain gesture with his hand in front of her eyes. A 15th century French calendar, the Calendrier, Calendrier des Burger, oh shit, Burger, Burgerier. So the Calendrier des Burgeriers, or Burgeriers, something like that, shows the shows the tortures inflicted by demons on people they have taken. The demons are depicted piercing their victims' abdomen with long needles. It's probably what human beings were doing. In fact, the psychological and invariable... What is this? In fact, the psychological and variable... And all these stories is unmistakable. The problem then is not to identify it, but to relate it in a rational manner to the physical features encountered during the observations. For example, the tracking by military radar operators of the UFO seen by the hills. Perhaps we should illustrate the difficulty of this problem by using a case that is less well known than the Hills incident, though it is quite as dramatic. It has never appeared in the English UFO literature and therefore cannot have influenced American UFO lore. Even in France, it is particularly unknown. The incident took place on May 20, 1950, at about 4 p.m. I cannot reveal the name of the witness or the exact location. I can say, however, that the witness was a woman and that the episode took place in the central region of France near the Loire, um, Loire? <coughs> See, Loire, Loire River. 
Um, an official investigation by Fran French local pol police has substituted the physical traces mentioned in this report, which can be translated thus. Mm, boy, here we go. God, I hope it's not too many French words. Anyways, it's time to take a break. Froze where he stood and noticed a small ball of red fire began to drift towards him. As if as it floated down, it expanded into a cloud of red mist. It dropped he dropped his light and machete and point his arms over his face as the mist enveloped him and lay passed out. This is confirmed by the unpublished memor memorandum written by uh, uh, R Ruppelt on uh, September 12, 1952 upon his return from West Palm Beach, Captain Rappelt and Lieutenant R. M. Olson Os Os began their um, investigation of the conference with by a conference with Captain Corney. Wing Intelligence E O E. I guess it's supposed to be an officer. But it's spelled O E C E R. So, uh, intelligence officer with the uh, 1707th uh, Air Base Wing on the morning of September 9th. The conference was held with Captain Corney to determine whether or not there had been any late developments in this case that the two ATIC officers <clears throat> were not familiar with Captain Corney st stated that he has he were not uh, officers were not familiar with Captain Corney st stated that to his knowledge, there was nothing outstanding that had happened. He was asked about the facts of supposedly anonymous threatening telephone calls that Mr. Desventure, uh, Desventures had received. He stated that Desventures had recalled him approximately two weeks earlier over two weeks ago and stated that he had rece been receiving anonymous threatening telephone calls while at work in the establishment establish in which he was employed. The gist of the calls was telling Disfingers to lay off of his story and that if he didn't, he would be sorry and several other things. Not so much attention was given to this claim, however, and Ruppelt continued his investigation by in interviewing people who knew the scoutmaster and especially the members of the scout group who were with him in the car when he decided to go into the woods. He gave the boys instructions to go get help if he wasn't back in 10 minutes and started in the woods. The boys claimed that they could see his flashlight going back in through the woods. From this point on, the boys' stories stories varied to a certain degree. The first boy states that he did not see the first light that Devonshire saw. However, shortly afterwards, after Devonshire had got out, and made the statement about flying saucers and got back into the automobile, he looked out of the window and saw a semicircle of white lights about three inches in diameter uh, going down at an angle of 45 degrees into the trees. 
None of the other Boy Scouts saw this. He then states that he saw Devonshire's go back into the woods and that the next thing that he saw was a series of red lights in the clearing. As soon as he saw the red lights, he claims that he saw Sonny st stiffen up and fall. According to two b b other boys, they both saw Defensers going through the woods, could uh, see flashlights flashing on the trees, and then he disappeared for, for a few seconds, and at least the light disappeared. The next thing they saw was a series of red lights. They said they looked a, a lot for a lot like like flares or sky rockets. The lights were not making any definite pattern. Some of them were going up and some of them were going down or going around and around in all directions. It just seemed to be a type of six or eight red lights going in all directions. This time they ran down the road to get help. Here we have confirmation from witnesses of the observation of red lights. The witnesses were not close enough, however, to experience the lights' effects. But it is interesting to remark that the lights kept going around and around uh, after the scoutmaster, according to his own account of the incident, was already unconscious. It is also interesting to note in this connection that over a century ago, Lerux D. Liney and his Leverdes legends had this to say about the elves. If a mortal being dares come near them, they open their mouths and struck by the breath which escapes from it. The imprudent fellow, fell, fellow dies poisoned. On October 7, 1954, Mr. Margalion Mr. Margalion uh, saw an object which had landed in a field in Montreux, France. If you pronounce that, if I pronounce that right, it was shaped like a hemisphere, about two and a half yards in diameter. The witnesses gasped for air and fell paralyzed during the observation. The sudden lack of air noted in the Cisco Grove case is not infrequently reported by witnesses of landings, nor are the peculiar eyes of the small entities reddish orange and glowing in the dark. On October 9, 1954, in La Vaux, Vienna, France, a farmer who was riding his bicycle suddenly stopped as he saw a figure dressed in a sort of diving suit uh, aiming a double light beam at him. The individual who seemed to have boots without heels, very bright eyes and a, a very hairy chest, carried two headlights, one below the other, on front of his suit. Nine days later, in Fontenay Torsi, also in France, a man and his wife reported that they saw a red cigar-shaped object in the sky. All of a sudden, it d uh, dived towards them, leaving a reddish trail and landed behind some bushes. Upon reaching the top of the hill, the witness found themselves confronted by a bulky individual, human in appearance but only about three feet tall. He wore a helmet and his eyes glowed with a orange light. One of the witnesses lost consciousness 
four other people saw the object in in flight from other spot from other spot a third group of independent witnesses in another town and uh, this is uh, San fuck San Soila Poitre saw a uh, craft fly away at tre tremendous speed in a westerly direction. The countryside was illuminated over the air at one or two miles wide. It is indeed appropriate to tell the man who investigates such cases and the words of Robert Herrick, her eyes, the glow worms led thee, the shooting stars and thee, and the elves also, whose little eyes glow like the sparks of fire, befriend thee. And so the next section, the next time we read, will be to Mangonia and back. And this probably this is why the, the book is called Passport to Mag Magonia. Okay, I was hurrying back home to prepare dinner. I was happy and content, and I was singing some popular tune everything was calm and still without any breeze or wind I was alone on the path suddenly I found myself within a brilliant blinding light and I saw two huge black hands appear in front of me black hands each one had five fingers have a black color with a yellowish tint somewhat like copper. The fingers were r roughly formed and slightly vibrating and quivering. That sounds familiar. <clears throat> These uh, hands did not come from behind me, but from above, as if they had been hanging over my head waiting the proper time to catch me. The black hands did not immediately apply themselves to my head. I probably took two or three steps before they touched me. The hands had no visible arms, and the two black hands I applied on my, to my face with violence and squeezed my head as a bird of prey rushing on its unfortunate helpless victim. They pulled my head back against a, a very hard chest, one that seemed to be made of iron. I felt the cold through my hair and behind my neck, of course, but now no contact with, with clothes. The hands were squeezing my head like a f formidable vice. That sounds familiar. Thanks to my friend JT, uh, and no, or not abruptly, but gradually. And they were very cold, and their touch made me think that they were not made of flesh. The big fingers were placed on my eyes, and I could not see any more. On my nose, so that I could not breathe, and also on my mouth to prevent me from crying out. When I was surrounded by a strong blinding light, I had the feeling I had been paralyzed. And when the hands touched me, I had a very distinct impression of a strong electric discharge, as if I had been shaken by a lightning bolt. My whole body was an an annihilated, helpless, and without reflex reflexes. I was like a broken toy between the inhuman hands of my unknown aggressors. But a little over a minute I felt his hands tightening very strongly on either side of my throat. 
it was horribly painful. And then I, he began to swing me forward and backward several times, still fiercely squeezing my head against his chest. I had the distinct impression that this being wore armor and or a steel carap I don't know if that is carapace. What's carapace? I have no idea. What is a carapace? Let's just get another one out. <clears throat> I'm probably not even selling it right. Cara. Did I spell it right? Cara. Carapace. A carapace is a the hard upper shell of a turtle, crustacean, or arachnid. Okay. Something regarded as a protective or defensive covering. Well, carapace. Do you think that my background in environment in ecology I've known that, but I didn't. So, and there we go. Anyways, it's like a shell, a turtle, or a, an insect, or a crustacean. Now I gotta find myself again. Electrical and unknown and pressure to the minutes later, struggling to begin to squeeze it in the throat and a furious with the compression. I mean, armor or steel carapace shell or some very hard or cold material. I felt his two invisible arms pressing heavily on my shoulders. It was at that moment that I heard his laugh, a strange laugh. I couldn't explain. It was as if I heard him through some water, and yet it seemed quite close above my head. At, at first it sounded rough and hushed then rather strong and rolling it made me shudder and hurt me after a few seconds uh, the laugh stopped suddenly cut off and then uh, a knee hit me in the back hurting me very much as if it were made of steel that made me think my aggressor was completely covered with steel this blow made me fall back and the unknown aggressor made me lie down still squeezing my head against his chest then he dragged me along the path and by my head and he seemed in a great hurry I did not hear him breathe He pulled me into a bush full of brambles and nettles and acacias still going backward at an incredible speed holding my head. At that moment I heard his voice above me and it said, There she is, we've got her. As if he were talking to someone else, some accomplice who had stayed inside the bush. This bush, there we go, there's bushes and these trees, right? The voice, like a laugh, seemed close by, although hushed by some obstacle. It was short, rough, and sharply cut. I was choking and I felt I was going to die. I thought of my family waiting for me at home. My whole life passed before me in a few seconds. My aggressor pulled me through the bushes until we reached a small pasture and suddenly he stopped. Why? His hands had gradually slipped down my face and I tried to call for help but I had no voice but no voice left but a tiny shrill cry. After a while I was able to sit among the brambles 
I had a very hard time breathing. My bag was still in my hand with my with money the money it contained. At last I was able to get up in spite of my weakness and then I heard some noises to my left side of the bushes. I thought I was going to see my aggressor <clears throat> aggressors recognized their faces but I saw nothing only the branches moved <coughs> only the, uh, the branches moved waving in the air I saw and heard the brambles scratching the empty space and the grass being pressed as if under the steps of some invisible being I was terrified. Softly, I took to the path again, walking with difficulty. My legs were lacerated by the brambles and bleeding. I felt a strange sensation of nervous exhaustion, indefinable, as if I had been electrified by a strong current. Well, because maybe I, it's a good thing I did leave that place with that crow Indian when I did. In my mouth was a sickening metallic bitter taste. My muscles did not obey me. Over my shoulders I felt something like a bar and in, in, in my back a painful heat. As if I had been exposed to flames and to a burning ray. At times I still felt as if I was being brushed by the invisible brush. By an invisible brush. I must have walked like that for five or six minutes. At the end of the path there was a turn and from there I could see houses and then the pains decreased a, a little bit. Everything had lasted a quarter of an hour to twenty minutes and it seemed that I had lived in an unreal, unreal world. Abruptly I heard a great noise like a violent wind during a storm and sudden displacement of warm air or a violent whirlwind. I saw the trees bending as if under a sudden storm. I was nearly thrown down almost simultaneously there was a strong blinding white light. I had the feeling something flew through the air very fast but I saw nothing. Soon everything became calm again. I felt discomfort and nausea. I reached the house of the lock of a, the lock keeper and when I opened the door, they came toward me and asked me what had happened. Because they too had seen a light from their house. The lock keeper's wife asked me what was wrong. When I was able to speak at last, uh, they told me all the, f all the f fingers were still deeply marked in the flesh on my face making large red bars. They applied peroxide to the scratches of my legs and an ointment and bathed my face with cold water. My hands were badly hurt. It sounds like a hell of a nightmare, geez. After a, a long lapse of time, I started again toward to buy a few things. Without saying anything to anyone, I came back home laboriously by another path. After I told my mother my fa and my father and my brother, too, what had happened to me, they filed a complaint with the Gendarmerie, so I guess the Gendarmerie, I guess it's like the police, is that what it means? The police came and interviewed me. At length, they examined me and observed the marks of large fingers on my face. I was still swollen, still swollen, and felt pain in several places. They concluded there had been an abduction attempt and told me that it was 
very strange, mysterious. They took me to the spot to continue their investigation. There, they noted that all the places, uh, the bramble were black and scorched. They noted that some of the places, uh, the brambles were black and scorched. At some other places, they were only pressed and flattened. The acacias, too, had been burnt in places. They were broken, too. The fences of the pasture, which were made of wooden posts and barbed wire, barbed wire, had suffered also. Had suffered also. Some posts were burnt, and others pulled out. The the barbed wire had been wrenched away and broken. The previous day, at May 19, in the evening, the witness in this case had observed a kind of sh shooting star, which stopped abruptly and then appeared to go up and stay among the other stars for a while, then grow bigger and take on a kind of swinging motion. Its light alternately on and off. Suddenly it left on the curved trajectory and reached the horizon at very high speed. She had dismissed the incident for her, from her mind at the time. The official investigation got nowhere and was dropped. The case is still carried as an unsolved abduction attempt. What can we say about such reports? They are neither more or nor less believable than other UFO sightings. They are in the line with some of the most dramatic stories of the older days, which inspired the fairy tales. They are also in line, as we shall see, with the visions of the 1897 airship and the incidents that followed it. But it is too early to theorize. It is better at this time merely to inspect the documents, though I must confess that I have previously regarded many such cases as worthless. Even if their documentation is not inf inferior to that of the more believable cases we study. Take another abduction case, one that allegedly occurred on August 21st, uh, 1915. Gallipoli, Gallipoli, August 28th, 1915. Following is an account of a strange incident that happened in the morning during the severest and final days of the fighting which took place at Hill uh, 60, uh, Suvla Bay, uh, then it says here, and ANZAC, Australian and New Zealand Army Corps. The day broke clear without a cloud in sight as any beautiful Mediterranean day could be expected to be. The exception, however, was a number of perhaps six or eight loaf of bread shaped clouds, all shaped exactly alike, which were hovering over Hill 60. It was noticed that in spite of a four or five mile and an hour breeze, from the south, these clouds did not alter their position in any shape or form, nor did they drift away under the influence of the breeze. They were hovering at an elevation of about 60 degrees as seen from our observation point 500 feet up. Also, it sounds familiar. Also stationary and resting ground. Right, what? Did I read that right? Also and resting on the okay on the ground, right underneath this group of clouds, 
was a similar cloud in shape, measuring about 800 feet in length, 200 feet in height, and 200 feet in width. This cloud was absolutely dense, almost solid looking in structure, and positioned about 14 to 18 chains from the fighting uh, in the British held territory. All this was observed by 22 men of number three section of number one field company and ZE including myself from our trenches on Rod uh, okay sorry press rhododendron on rhododendron spur okay rhododendron spear approximately 2,500 2, yards southwest of the cloud and the ground our vantage point was overlooking hill 60 by about 300 feet as it turned out later this single cloud was straddling a dry creek bed or sunken road and then this uh, Kaya Jack I don't know how to press that. Durr. Whatever that means. Uh, he had. We had a perfect view of the clouds. Sides. And ends as it rested in the ground. Its color was a light gray. As was the color of the other clouds. A British regiment. The 1st, 4th Norfolk of uh, several hundred men was then noticed marching up this sunken road or creek towards hill 60. it appeared as though they were going to reinforce the troops on hill 60 however when they arrived at this cloud they marched straight into it with no hesitation but no one ever came out to deploy or fight at hill 60. About an hour later, after the last of the file had disappeared into it, this cloud very uh, obtrusively, obtrusively lifted off the ground and, like any fog or cloud would, rose slowly until it joined the other similar clouds which were m mentioned in the beginning of this account. Our viewing them again on viewing them again, they all looked alike as peas in a pod. I don't know why I put a B there instead of no. Uh, all this time, the group of clouds had been hovering in the same place, but as soon as the singular ground cloud had risen to their level, they all moved away northwards, i.e. towards uh, Thrace. Bulg uh, Bulgaria in a matter of about three quarters of an hour they had all disappeared from view the regiment mentioned in is posted as missing or wiped out and on Turkey sur surrendering on, on, on Turkey surrendering in 1918 the first thing Britain demanded from Turkey was the return of this regiment. Turkey replied that she had neither captured this regiment nor made contact with it and did not know that it existed. A British regiment in 1914 through 18 consisted of any number between 800 and 4,000 men. Those who observed the incident vouched for the fact that, that that Turkey never captured the regiment nor made contact with it, we, the un undersigned, we the under undersigned as the late in time, that is the fiftieth jubilee of the A A N Z A C landing declare that the above described incident is true in every word signed by witnesses 
four uh, slash one hundred and fifty sixty five Sapper F Reichart uh, Matata Bay of Plenty and thirteen slash four hundred sixteen Sapper R uh, newness new newness uh, 157 King Street Cambridge <clears throat> um, JL Newman 73 Freiburg Street uh, to a uh, to to Ranga, I guess. I don't know if any of those words they said any of those right. And we'll end it there. We're now at 108, page 108. The next one we'll be reading is Taken by the Wind. Interesting stuff. Don't know how, what to make most of it, but it's very interesting stuff. You're going to try go all the way. Otherwise, don't even start. If you are going to try, go all the way. This could mean losing girlfriends, wives, relatives, jobs, and maybe your mind. Oh, it's no change.